I think we can, we'll see if there are any, any questions right now, otherwise we can keep some for the end. So does anybody have any question for Cristiano now? Okay, we'll keep it to the end. Uh, next I would like to introduce Bruce Hamilton, it's my pleasure. Um, and uh, Bruce is going to talk about the classification of muscle injuries. We might think that we all know it already, but he has some very interesting ideas which he backs up with uh, the literature. So I'm glad to hand over to Bruce. Thanks, Celeste, and uh, good afternoon. It's really fantastic to be here back in Qatar um, and uh, talking on this topic. And I'd certainly like to thank the organising committee, um, all those that Chris, Cristiano has uh, so well gone through. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come back and talk about this topic. Just thought I'd clarify where I am from to start with. Um, New Zealand is right down there in the bottom corner. It's an awful long way from here, and uh, arriving at 6 o'clock yesterday morning um, was a bit of a challenge. Um, so excuse me if I seem a little bit lethargic on it. New Zealand is a small country, about 4 million people, um, but uh, we like to think we punch above our weight and we produce some pretty good athletes in a range of sports. But of course we're most famous for our rugby team and um, we're looking forward to beating France in another final this year at the Rugby World Cup. Um, New Zealand does uh, have a handball team and, and uh, it's great to see some New Zealand handball representatives uh, here as well. And this is the under-19 women's team that recently won the um, Oceania Championships, but um, it's fair to say it's a minority sport in New Zealand um, and it's certainly not a sport that high performance sport um, funds in New Zealand. So why should we be interested in classification and grading of muscle injuries? Because this is something that certainly when I was growing up in sports medicine I thought we had pretty much nailed. So you know, why would this still be of interest to us? Well from my perspective it's interesting from an academic perspective and from a clinical perspective, but obviously we're also um, getting a lot of pressure and interest from coaches and managers but also the CEOs of organisations because let's not kid ourselves that in the professional sporting age this is big business and being able to know what is going on with an athlete's injury is a critical part of what we're trying to do these days. And that's reflected in the fact that in the last four or five years there's been quite a lot of interest in classification and grading of muscle injuries and there's been at least these four papers come out all attempting to describe um, the muscle injuries that we all seem to know so well. They're all slightly different and they're all taking on board a lot of the new information that's come on over the last 10 years. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the background to these. Um, with the ultimate question really is, you know, do they work and is it worthwhile? And when you ask that question, it's important to think about it in what context you're framing at the question. And, uh, I quite like it from the academic and clinical context, but we've also got to keep in mind, as I said, that business end of what we're linked to as well. Now, when those papers um, were published, they, tend, they, they all described that there was a background in, uh, to the classification and grading of muscle injuries. And they all talk about three or four papers that have been published over the last 100 years um, that described it. And typically, and this is from the uh, Muller-Wolfhart's paper, which is a fantastic paper, They'll talk about a couple of papers from the 1960s where grading was first described, and then in the 90s when imaging came on board, um, these pa the um, imaging started to play a role in the way that we were grading. And that's the extent of the literature that sort of is, re is repeatedly sort of highlighted as where our basis in classification and grading comes from. And when you go back to those papers, there's really not a lot in them, and so it just made us start to question, well, you know, what is the background in, in grading um, and classification of muscle injuries. And that led to this paper, which was a, a um, joint product between Aspitar and FC Barcelona doctors, and uh, this was a, a real joy to work on. And we essentially went back through all the papers that we could find where there was anyone described or slightly changed a classification and grading system, and that's in British Journal. So what I'd like to do is just talk about a few of the features of that that we, that we discovered when we started to look back through that literature. And the first one is the terminology and the use of the terms to classify and to grade. Because what we found in the literature was that actually those terms are used interchangeably and without any real clarity on what's being spoken about. So I just want to clarify what they actually do mean from a medical perspective. So to classify, 
is to describe or categorize the nature of the injury. So this is to say that this was a contusion or a direct impact injury, or this was a strain type injury pattern. That's what Cristiano was just talking about. Um, the classification to classify like this hasn't really changed over the last 100 years. So this was described in the 19, early 1900s, and we're still using essentially the same clinical classification system um, with minimal changes uh, to today. Now to grade is different. So to grade refers to providing a degree, a reflection of the degree of injury severity. And this has changed over the last 100 years. And when you think about this, um, it's important, this is how I like to, to think about what we're talking about with grading. In a perfect scientific world, we would, un we would know the pathology of a particular injury. So we would take a biopsy of the muscle injury and know exactly what's going on. Now obviously we can't do that and there's no data of biopsying um, athlete muscle injuries. Because we can't do that, over the last 50 years, people have used clinical and imaging in the more recent times to act as a proxy of what the actual pathology is and what's actually going on. But of course, there's no direct correlation and no one's actually looked at what the relationship between clinical and imaging and underlying pathology is because we don't know the underlying pathology. So instead, we use return to play, which is a nice clinical measure of our severity. But it's not a direct measure of the physiological injury that's gone on. And the problem with using return to play as an outcome measure or an injury, a measure of severity, is that it's influenced by a whole lot of external variables that are outside, sorry, we've got a rush of people going through the back there, that is going on outside the body. So the pressure on them from the manager, um, the psychology of the athlete, previous injuries, all of those factors will start to affect the return to play. So imaging and clinical are always going to struggle to d determine the return to play and we have no evidence around the pathology. So just to explore that a little bit more around the grading. So this is how we would typically classify categorically muscle injuries. So we would classify an injury into one, two, or three, or four, or five, depending on which classification system you choose to use. Thinking that picking whatever variable we've got, we, we can put them in one group and that that will fit um, that and that will have a different outcome for them. And that's how we typically think about it. But it was interesting yesterday, I was having a discussion with Roald Barr about this, and he always provokes me and makes me think about things. And so he clarified for me that actually this is more like what we will be seeing, is that it's a skewed distribution. So that's the first point. They won't be normally distributed within each of those groups. And the reality is that it will look more like this. That even though we might be able to show that there's a difference between the means of these three groups, the ability to predict from that is very limited because of the huge overlap between each of these groups that we're putting people into, which after all are relatively arbitrary groups from a physiological perspective. So if we go back, well, when did this grading start? Well, it started a long, long time ago, but by 1966, Rashan, in this fantastic book, um, where they went through and described a whole lot of grading for a whole lot of different things, put together the first really great um, grading system for muscle injuries. They talk about first degree, second degree, third degree, and you can look at the more details of that at any time. But they also had some great insights. So first of all, they recognize that they tend to recur. Second of all, they recognize that it's at the musculotendon junction, both of which are areas that we're exploring a lot more still these days. And third, that it can come about from either a contraction or an overstretch injury, which is again something that we're still talking about these days. So in 1966, we had a solid foundation for what we're talking about today. Over the next 40 years, so between, or the next 30 years, between 1970 and 2000, um, there were a whole lot of individual changes to the way we would describe or grade muscle injuries. But the key change over that time was that in the late 80s and 90s, we started to use imaging. We've got to understand how the imaging was being used at that time. So what would happen is that a grade two injury would come into your clinic, you would send it off to the radiologist who would do either an MRI or an ultrasound, and they started describing what a grade two injury looked like. And so they had 100% correlation between the clinical and the radiological description because they were describing what was being sent to them. And that was all those early papers essentially were. So by 15 years ago, we had clearly established classification and grading systems in the literature, and we had some early descriptive imaging studies but the key point is that there was absolutely no evidence at all, and this is after I was doing my training, that there was any relationship between the grading and the classification and the underlying pathology, 
or return to play times. So both of the key measures that we could use for actually determining the, the validity of the grading systems that we're using, there was no evidence at all. That's not the end of my talk. It might just be the end of my flicker. Okay. All right, we'll go again. So what's happened in the last 15 years? Um, and this is a time that most of us in this room looking around will have actually been looking at the literature and, and being aware of this. So in the last 15 years, when we looked through all of the literature that's out there, there's been three key elements. The first of those is that there's been a real drive to develop an evidence base for categorical grading. And that's both a clinical evidence base, and that's from a lot of the Australians, so Jeff Verrill and his group, looking at clinical drivers for grading. And radiologically, and again, the UEFA group needs some real commendation, of which I know Marcus does a lot of work with, um, in terms of trying to look at some evidence base around grading systems. But these are grading systems that are based on a radiological system that are based on a clinical system that are based on nothing other than expert opinion. So the second thing that's changed is that we're starting to look at continuous variables. So using MRI, we can now measure the length and the width and the volume and the depth and the, all of those elements and actually start to see whether any of those elements have a clinical relevance in terms of return to play. And the third thing that's happened over the last 15 years is that the people have started to try and take some of that continuous variables in the grading and start to put them into a mix to come up with these novel systems that we're now looking at um, over the last five or six years, um, including the work from, from Muller Wolfhart and others. So what I'd just like to briefly talk about is, okay, well, how valid is the information that we're using on continuous variables to be putting into these new systems that are being developed? And the, the easiest and quickest way to do that is to refer to this great paper that I know Adam is going to talk about a little bit more. So I won't go into the details of it, but this is essentially a, a meta-analysis of uh, all, all of the, incident, all of the uh, injury data around hamstrings and return to play using MRI. And when you do that, you can see that really there's not a lot. So it's great. We know that if you've got an MRI negative, then you will do better. That's fantastic. We know that if the tendon is involved in the hamstring injury, that actually you might do worse. But other than that, there's very, very little evidence at all around any of the imaging studies to help us with return to play. So what we're left with then is a situation where we'd love to know the pathology but we're never going to. We would, we'd, would like to have a relationship between clinical and or imaging and return to play. But in fact, what the studies are showing now is that we're very poor at using imaging to predict return to play. And without that, we're left back where we were in 1966 when Rashan essentially pulled together nothing at all to say that, look, this is probably how we should do this and we can come up with uh, these three grades to describe it. And why is that? So just to conclude on that, why is that? Well, until very recently, there's been limited financial interest in hamstring injuries and in sports medicine in general. Um, you know, this, this picture obviously highlights that that can change uh, when you, once you start to get um, high finance in sport and actually the, the uh, drivers that come around that. But there's still, despite the, the fact that muscle injuries, hamstring injuries are one of our biggest time loss injuries and they, and they cause us huge amounts of grief in all sports, there's still relatively few subjects involved in research studies in hamstring injuries or muscle injuries in general. And that's quite remarkable when you consider how long we've been looking at it for. The final point I'd like to make on this is that it's a complicated research to be looking at this. And to highlight that, I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about the way UEFA studies. And, and, um, and uh, to start with, I'd like to say how good they are because it's fantastic to see people collecting data. But one of the challenges I have is that I know, even in the organisations I've worked in, that there's a huge range of ways that you will treat any given hamstring injury, if we take hamstrings as the, as the exemplar. And we would anticipate that the reason that we're doing those different treatment regimes is because we believe that we are changing the natural history of that, that um, hamstring injury. Now, when you do a big study involving multiple clubs where you don't look at actually what the treatment is and when you don't standardise the treatment, then you don't know, you're not studying the natural history of the illness, you're studying what the actual outcome was, which may, may bear no bearing at all to actually what the initial severity or nature of the, the injury was. 
And so you're not, you're not reflecting the natural history. And if you change someone from 23 days to 22 days, then you will change the grade of that uh, person and you might change the way that uh, the MRI is interpreted. So it's, it is difficult research to do. And, uh, and I commend the people that are doing research in this area, but, it, but you do have to look at it critically. So my take home message would be that there's a lot of um, um, expert opinion still forming the basis for what we're talking about when we're grading and classifying. There's very limited evidence out there uh, to support categorical or continuous grading of muscle injuries. Um, to me, it makes no sense to categorically grade a muscle injury, which is an extremely complex injury involving multiple tissues, um, which we will see at different time points. And to try and grade that into a simple box is not how physiology or pathology works. So it makes no sense to me, and it seems to be gr grossly oversimplifying the reality. But with that comes a huge opportunity for us all to be looking at this area more closely and to be challenging what variables we should actually be doing and how we should be giving advice to our managers on what's actually going on with our athletes. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers. A great session. I um, really think um, you did a great job. Can I ask a question to perhaps Bruce and Adam? So if I, if I uh, hear correctly, it is absolutely fine then not to do any imaging. Uh, lots of players, lots of athletes, um, teams will not have access to expensive MRI scans or even ultrasound scan or whatever. So is the message then it's absolutely fine, make the clinical diagnosis, rehab them well and don't do any imaging. Is that what you do in New Zealand, Bruce? <laughs> yeah, my imaging profile is a little different in New Zealand to what it was in Aspatar, it's fair to say. Um, I think you've got to look at the population you're working with. I think it, it varies. You have different motives for doing imaging in different, with different groups. And so I don't think that you can go to a, a population of weekend warriors and suggest that you need to do an MRI. I think we're, we're quite comfortable with that. Um, but I think in an elite sporting environment, there's different pressures and different requirements. And so you may use the MRI to convince people of an injury or to convince there's not much there or whatever way you want to do it. And so I think the reasons for doing an MRI can vary beyond trying to provide a, a, uh, a time that we're going to return the person to sport. There's more factors to consider than that. So I think that would be my only, only mitigation on that. But uh, you know, we, we, the value of the MRI and return to play is, is still to be determined, really, as we've said. So.